Thank you all for coming, and um, thanks to John. Um, the, I think it's really appropriate to be showing some of John's collages in the show because the premise of the show was of, based on the, the strange, um, quite ambiguous and dreamlike um, see, famous glass of milk sequence in Hitchcock's Suspicion, which was made in 1941. And... John's collages, of which this is a recent example, is this in the Hayward Gallery in your show, The Hayward at the moment? Um, actually, I can't remember. Um, no. Okay. Does it have a title? It's part of a series called... Sorry, it's part of a series of uh, pieces called <coughs> Spheres. So they're all collages made with a circular cut into yeah. them. And it's... Um, but the, the stills from the film, you, you, you obviously, um, I've been looking at this image for about five days on my computer in um, preparation for this, and um, it's um, quite um, mesmeric the way so much is generated out of so little, because it's such a simple cut. Um, with one film still laid over the top of another, um, but yet, in doing, in making this very very simple gesture, you seem to completely change the whole symbolic order of the um, film still images. Um, it's interesting as well that the stills um, seem to be from. Um, the early 1940s, um, so exactly the same period as Hitchcock's suspicion. But of course, with these two stills, they're um, <clears throat> probably now very obscure Hollywood movers. And um, we're, although we're aware of their theatricality, um, with, with sort of a lost connection with the actual narratives that each film still might represent. But in, in splicing them together, you've sort of overlapped time and space and almost reordered what I would call the narrative within the image. But I was wondering whether you would consider this piece of work a narrative work or whether as I thought, perhaps, looking at it, that it might be more to do with destroying narrative. Yeah. You're, you guessed right. Yes. <laughs> There's a wonderful book written by a man, a historian called Hans Belting, um, which looks at the image before art, before the Renaissance, in a way. And he divides the author pieces into... Two, two parts. The, the main image, which is he calls the imago, which is the image of the saint. And then around the edge, you've got the, the lives of the saint, and that's called historia, that's the, the narrative. These are small, like comic strips, really, of yeah. what happens to yeah. the saint. And his argument is that as we get into the Renaissance, and as art becomes a concept that dominates the practice of image production, we get to a situation in which historia becomes the main thing. In other words, the narrative becomes the main thing, and image becomes dead, reduced. And to cut a long story short, if you look at the whole history of image making from that point on, from the Renaissance through to cinema, mm. where that, I would argue, historia becomes total. Mm. So I see my work as a up kind until of, cinema, or yeah, up until cinema, cinema, the computer takes it further. Okay. So we become more and more involved in historia. So narrative. cinema breaks history. No, cinema breaks makes history complete. So the imago has no possibility of so the, intervening anymore. So cinema is a total narrative form, yeah, totally right. based. We live narrative. in a totally narrativized culture. So narrative and the aesthetic separate. Yeah, exactly. So I feel that what I'm doing is a kind of resistance movement. Tiny resistance. Uh, on behalf of Imago, you might say, image. 
to return a nar- a, a, an image that is, all, as it were, trapped by its own narrative yeah. back into an aesthetic state. I think that we live in a culture in which we are trapped by the succession of images. We never have a chance to catch up with images. Images are always being succeeded, either culturally or physically, <coughs> in cinema, TV, computer consumption, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, there, there is very little space for it, for a disjunction from narrative, from historia, from history, and historical consciousness. Cause uh, ideology. Yeah, and, yeah. And that yeah. is an ideology. I think it's a hegemony. Um, so, image is actually, even though image is everywhere, it's everywhere in chains. You might say, and uh, the chains are narrative chains. Um, given that your collages clearly creates a, a very, very strong aesthetic effect, what, why is it that you need to use narrative images? Yeah, that's the big question. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. Um, the other thing I, I, I wondered was whether the artificiality, because in, the, in these images are particularly cheesy Hollywood images. You've got the brill creams guy with the cardigan the woman with the rolling pin. Um, yeah. And I was wondering... And whether, the African mask. Well, and, the, and, but, and the African mask looks like it's been not done by a Hollywood props person. Yes, it's, it's completely fake. So the, the complete fakeness of both images mm-hmm. is, is, is very powerfully present. What, why, why, why use images that are fake rather than, say, Gary Winner Grand or... Henry Cartier Brasson or, or I don't know. Or, I really don't know. I mean I've tried using a whole variety of images. It, it seems that there are only certain kinds of images that, that, that I can use. I don't know why. Somebody yeah. as a critic did a kind of um, a sort of statistical survey of the images used in my work and came, and came and actually identified lots of the sources. It didn't interest me very much actually where they came from. Yeah, but they, they did well, see, anyway. he must have been missing the point a bit. Oh, what, what's not, not uh, she anyway. But I, I don't saying. know whether she was really missing the point, but she was interested in why I chose images from a particular period. And she worked out that the majority of the images that I use, or let's say the statistical mean, or whatever you want to call it, comes around about 90, between 45 and 48, she said. Oh. Uh, I was born in 1949, so rather oh. than it being a sort of nostalgic regression to my early childhood or anything, it seems I seem to be mostly attracted to images that occurred before I was born. Is there something particularly uncanny about sort of imagining the few years... Well, that years was her before. argument. Her yeah, interesting, yeah. you've guessed uh, what her uh, argument was. But those few years before one's own birth, the particularly... Right. Yeah, she's used that very argument, that the, the definition of the uncanny. I mean, uh, Burke, um, the Irish philosopher, said of the sublime... The sublime is an attachment to the world in our absence. Yes, yes. Um, and it's the wilderness, you know, without, the world without us, or the world yes. before we were born, as a projection of the world after we we're all gone, an apocalyptic projection as well. It could be something to that. I really don't know. Though other people have argued that it's very much, I mean, there's one art historian who's argued that, what I, that in my marriage pieces, where I'm Marry male and female actors from this period. And I'm actually marrying my mother and father. Yeah. Which is, I, I, I know. I laughed at first, and then I sort of realised there was a lot of truth in this. Um, and they would have been going because to in the a way cinema. somebody else has said that, that they're all my self-portraits, and in a way they are. You know, which yeah. is exactly a marriage of my parents. I suppose. Were your parents cinema goers? No. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I was brought up by parents who. I wouldn't say they were puritanical, it's more a class thing. They disapproved of the cinema. Yeah. And, uh, in fact... Did they, they disapprove of art as well? Yes, they did, actually. Well, they disapproved of art as a profession for their son. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. But I, 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 I can list the films that I saw in my childhood. I saw Snow White when I was about five. I saw Ben-Hur when I was about 11. I mean, it was like that. I had yeah. Like two or three yeah. films. Yeah. So... And they, had to, they stayed with you, those yeah. films. Yeah, I became very attached to the images I saw on the outside of cinema, which I think is where a lot of this comes from. Yeah. Um, this um, collage, which is also in 
John's room in Mirror City um, at the Hayward. Um, immediately when I saw it, it, it made me think of the Velasquez painting of the dwarf. Oh, yeah. um, for some reason that came into my head. But one of the things that is um, quite vivid about this piece of work is that the um, woman um, is leaning out of the window, so she's inside the house looking out, and then the man's body, um, and I don't know whether you can see, but the cut in this piece is a, is a rectangle but at an angle, so right angle. The, lamp, the lamp is um, part of the image of the man coming in through the window, so the figure is moving outside and inside simultaneously. It's very, very strange. That's very strange. Yeah, it's one of my favourites from this particular series. It's called <coughs> The Ventriloquist. And it was based on really a doll, more than a dwarf, or a child. Um, so in all of the Ventriloquist series, they have these slightly enlarged heads and a division between usually male and female in the body. I don't know why yeah. male and female I and why? Yeah. But, the work, but as soon as I did this one, is this when, which year is this from? Is this from? This is last year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, two th- yeah. Yes. Um, it's a kind of extension of another series called Imposter. But when I started to use the enlarged heads, somehow the word ventriloquist popped into my head. Uh, it, perhaps like the uh, was it Carol Reed film Dad of Night I don't know but yeah. did you ever see that the I ventriloquist did, yes. I, I, I used to be completely freaked out by all those ventriloquist films but, yeah, yeah. The yeah. 50s, yeah there was an obsession with them wasn't it in the 50s I don't know why yeah it seems to have died out as a sort of act yeah. these days but um, the puppet the animated um, but there were a lot of horror films centred with on them, I think too. With puppets, so you see her as a puppet, this figure as a puppet. Kind of, I suppose, yeah. I Did think the, the coming, I mean, the man is a burglar who's in, coming in, breaking yeah, into a The house. Strangler is taken from oh, is a it? film called The Strangler. Yeah, I, see, I, don't, I actually tend to, to ignore my the attack. <laughs> if they're too obstructive and I can't help them, yeah. I cut them out. Do you, do you find it hard to cut them off? Does it yes, because really it does violate the, the, the whole image, but sometimes it's better to violate the image than to have yeah. an inappropriate word glaring at you. The, the other thing I noticed is that you've started using the motif of the blurred picture that's in the background um, here. I don't know whether that... And here we've got a sort of Louis Cattles... That's right. I think it was a kind of um, mirror. Of I've done uh, that in a yeah, few yeah. new pieces, actually. A very observant, that one. <laughs> I didn't think anybody would notice that. Um, I mean, this collage... That's the one that started the series, Ventrilo. I gave this... This is what gave it the title. I think it's obvious, more obvious here. But here the head is completely absent. And, and the body is very, very puppet-like yeah. in this. Um, but the man with the hat is, um, seems a sort of manipulator. Um, the whereas the other man has been sort of pushed back. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you think about your pieces? I mean, it's clear to me that you obviously must think about your pieces in terms of push and pull, but, or in those sort of abstract terms, in terms of <coughs> space, the way you splice together different spaces. Did, did, did abstract painting, that, that seems to be part of how you deal with the field of the image. Yeah. It is. I mean, I, I find it very really difficult to say yeah. what, I, what I, am, I... I have certain aims at certain points, but the work for me always takes off when, when, things, when something unexpected happens and whatever it is that I intended defies my intentions. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's difficult to say whether it's a formal apprehension that I'm trying to encourage. Certainly form, formalism comes into it. I yeah. want to see the picture as a whole, because that's what you can't ever see in cinema. Yeah. You're always absorbed into the next one. You never get a sense of what it is as a whole. <coughs> and the only yeah. access to that that we have are in this kind of subsidiary photographic genre of, of film, film stills. So I'm trying yeah. to, yes, allow for, for that what that is denied to us in cinema formal apprehension of the picture. 
in a quite conventional way. Yeah. Um, this, I think, is a really extraordinary early piece. I think this is... What year is this from? 1979. So 1979. So in a way, the context for this, just to remind the audience, of it would be perhaps the work... I'm, I'm thinking of other photo-based artists who are coming out of conceptual art, so, it, or image-based artists. So I'm thinking perhaps Gilbert and George's work or... Your tutor. They would have been an influence at the time, definitely. And also Victor Bergen is your tutor. Yes, he, well, he did teach me for a while. Um, and we, can, can, I, can, I, can I just hmm. say, Victor Bergen, for those of you who don't know, made photo conceptual pieces that were very coming out of feminist theory. Yeah. He was but, an image caption man. Yeah, yeah. I had a go at that, image caption stuff. Yeah, I saw a catalogue of yours. I found a catalogue of yeah. some work that I'd never seen. Yeah, right. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. You must give it to me. I destroy all of that. It's in <laughs> Winchester School of Art Life. Right. I shall go there and meet <laughs> yeah. The Brecht who said, um, bury your past or something. Cover your tracks. Cover your tracks. Because you, you, you've said um, that you found that the use of text in conceptual art was a cul-de-sac and you wanted yeah. to return to a kind of fascination with the image. Well, it's the same thing yeah. about narratives, yeah. I mean, the, yeah. I, I see cinema as being the narrative chains of, of language holding on to them. You know? Yeah. And it's very similar. Um, but nevertheless, um, in, I mean, you're in some ways, I mean, this piece is interesting because you're almost demanding us to read Across, so you've got here the image of um, a, fr a castle in France, a postcard, Switzerland, Switzerland a, quite a kitsch postcard, and you're asking us to read across from this image into the film still, and one finds all sorts of extraordinary <laughs> formal analogies. So, for example, one can't help associating the castle, which is quite austere, um, with the Blind, the blindfolded face of the man and then there are flashes of light such as the light on the, wa the crashing waves or on the mountain which one then can trace into the glass um, on the table or the reflections in the window so, and there's also a ship in the, in the it, yes there's a, sh there's a ship here and a whale um, and a storm <clears throat> in the foreground yeah I don't know how it came about but I have been reading <coughs> Byron's epic poem, um, which is all about Xion, the prisoner of Xion, I don't know if people are aware of that. But he, but the, yeah, quite a romantic poet, Byron. Yes. That, 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 that castle, however picturesque, was actually a prison. Ah. And it housed a family of Republican prisoners um, in the 17th or was it 16th century, I can't remember, but oh. way a long time ago. And gradually they all died and were buried in the floor of the Xion Castle until there was one prisoner left. And he survived until um, Switzerland became a republic and he was liberated. Um, and a statue was erected to him. He was made a great hero of Switzerland. Um, but he couldn't face the multitudinousness of the world. And he'd been living in solitary isolation. 40 years, 50 years. And oh. He couldn't deal with the overwhelmingness of the world. And he actually chose to go back to the prison to spend the rest of his life there. How and, depressing. Yeah. And By Byron, in the, in the 19th century, was sailing with Shelley just by there. And in a prefiguration of Shelley's early death, they, they nearly capsized in a, a sudden storm which happens on Lake Geneva. And when they went ashore near, nearby, uh, Byron had a, a villa nearby, of course. Um, they heard the story of the prisoner of Xion, and Byron immediately wrote, started to write the poem. And the poem is really about sensory deprivation, about blindness, not being able to see. Oh. And, he, and Byron associates this with the idea of art. <coughs> of art, in a way, has to cut off the senses in order to release the inner world. So it becomes an allegory for Byron about solitude. 
it's interesting because you've identified, having looked at this image a lot, I now understand what it was that I found so ominous about the um, castle, and it's because now that I know it was a prison, I can see that the windows are so small, and that's what gives it a sort of feeling of ominousness. And the, the blindfolded man is in prison, but still carrying out, as it were, his conventional bourgeois routine. It's a frightening image of, of, sort of entrapment. The, yeah, I see the blind man. The, the blind man is an interesting figure in cinema. He's blindfolded, not blind, of course. But yeah. behind him, you can tell these two other figures like, yeah. are conspiring behind him. You sense there's a conspiracy. And within the narrative flow, the blind man's always a bit like a kind of island, an obstacle. They don't, the blind isn't, they don't belong to that scopic regime of, of cinema. Yeah. They're kind of, like an, I saw him as like an island within the flow. They're a bit rigid. There's, yeah. They don't fit in. Everything's going on around them and behind them like a river. Yeah. Or like a lake. Yeah. Incidentally, the same scene, the, the person who took that photograph was obviously aware of the Byron poem, but he was also aware that that is the most familiar, uh, it was Corbet's favourite vantage point. Corbet, late in life, in exile from France, ended up living exactly there and actually made a living selling paintings of Chion to tourists. Okay. And, and kind of complex layering yeah, of history. Imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in, in sort of putting the two images together again, you're, you seem to be opening them out into a kind of what, what seems to be more like a field rather than the illusionistic space of each image. Together they seem almost to... Time seems to circulate in a different way. Which is that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I thought it was a kind I, of... I, I mean, I, although I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying to still defend the idea that there is narrative in your work, but I think that you somehow do something with time in splicing different times together that so discombobulates sort of linear narrative time it almost, that it almost opens up narrative into a sort of field space. I mean, I'm using a phrase that's used a lot in relation to abstract expressionist painting. Um, it, can I just say, one, the other thing was that I noticed in the Hannah Hogg, um, another collage artist, Hannah Hogg, um, at the Whitechapel, that when you got upstairs, the colour pieces that were made in the 1950s also seemed to reference the field space of abstract expressionism. Yeah. No, it was a revelation, wasn't it, that show? Yeah. yeah. I must uh, say, I yeah, should have yeah. known more about it. I was asked, actually, if I you know, yeah. write, write about it, but yeah. it happened like it was ill, and I couldn't do yeah. it. But uh, I just felt kind of embarrassed that I had ignored her. Like, like, yeah. like most people, we just assumed she was a sort of Berlin Dardais. Yeah. Um, it it, it, it continued to develop yeah. her work. Yeah, really. but, do you, do you see um, things in terms of feel, of yeah, the field? Yeah, I think that collage one? has that ability to, yeah. to be a kind of escape from time. Yeah. Um, and to allow different temporalities to it. I mean, most of my um, films still in postcard combinations have a tendency to combine sort of 1940s, 50s film stills with much earlier postcards. This is one of those exceptions, of course. You had to have yeah. <laughs> But um, on the whole, they, that's in the last one because of kind of, and I like that idea of collapsing time. Yeah. I saw if if, if the forties and fifties film still images are like parental images, then I, the postcards are often grand parental images. Yes. But as I say, this is an exception. This is the other way around. Well, this, this has an extraordinary sense of time because a bit like in that um, Vermeer painting in the of the woman in the uh, Rijks Museum in Amsterdam of a woman pouring the milk jug, the milk out of the jug. You've got this flow, liquid flow, at the centre of this postcard of a waterfall, which gives you... The, and the movement of that almost seems to make the man, the actor, um, almost turn to stone. It's quite surreal. Who do you... Do you, you must love Magritte. Who do you... Who, would you like Salvatore Dali? Um, I sort of have my, uh, I mean, you know... Who do you, do you prefer Magritte? Yes, I do. I do, I always have. Yeah. But I do think that, I mean, some of the 
most important breakthroughs I've made in my work. I've seen, I've gone back and realized that Dali did it sort of 30 yeah. years earlier. He's irritating like that. Yeah. You, you can't like Dali, but you have to respect him. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's a genius, too. Yeah. Um, the, <coughs> the, um, sorry, what's this series called again? The, the, the Masks. Um, the, again, you're, you're, you're sort of com- the portrait, which is always a, a genre, in, in this case, the film portraits from the same period again, but they always seem to exist. They're very, they're very present in, in, in a way that the sublime landscape is vast, deep, and sort of timeless. Yes. Um, are you this was a point. I'm always trying to put the mask series, bring it to a closure. Um, I, yeah. I, with all my series, I'm trying, yeah. I spent a lot of time yeah. trying to do the last one. And this has that happened many times. This, this was one of those occasions where I thought I've done it now because I thought well, okay. with, with, with the previous masks, like the one you showed before, there was always some image that you could see as a metaphor of interiority. Yeah. Like a yeah. cave, forest. Yeah. In fact, I've actually Bachelard lists three spaces of, of reverie, in which he calls have, yeah. have this dialectic of inside and outside caves, forests and ruins. And I've used all three. Ah, of them that's interesting. And I thought by blasting through the cave to the other side, something yeah. like that would be the ultimate death of that interior space. It's but they just initiated another they, they, they're not particularly redemptive in the way they think about interior space, in a sense, because there's also the sense of vast emptiness as well, yeah. um, which to gives tell them you a... Truth, I, I always saw them as, as comic. Um, ah, but I've realised that people have taken them a lot more seriously than I do. Yeah. <laughs> and I suppose I've tended now to go along. I never really do know what I'm doing with these things. I, I, it sounds as though I do, I know. I mean, what... This is almost a sequel. <coughs> As soon as I did that, I thought, right, we were completely a, blasted open. It's an amazing piece. I mean, it's an incredible image. But one of, one of the things that's so fascinating about the series is that, obviously, chance plays an enormous part in your, uh, in your process, and you must, have, you, you, you must have hundreds of images in flux all the time as you're making these collages. But w- w- your collages never seem to have been... Although one can see that, they seem to go beyond chance. This, this can't really be reduced to just a chance occurrence. It's too perfect, in a way. Well, Is I that should... what you're looking for, to go beyond chance? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I started off <coughs> quite early on, and I yeah. abandoned it. Yeah. Uh, when I first started off, I started off very much trying to do it according to the rules of chance. You know, yeah. Uh, in a, like a sort of like John, John Cage. Yes, sort John Cage. Of, yeah, really yeah. Silence. Like yeah, yeah. Sort of like, it really didn't sound Do you like silent. John Cage's music? Um, or? No, no, no. 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 What, what, what do you like listening to music wise as much? Uh, my favourite composer, I suppose, would be Arvo Pert. Okay, that's interesting. And do you like any rock, pop, no. anyone? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I listen mainly to polyphonic choral music. Okay, that's interesting. And um, so you you were putting things together with chance influence by yeah. John Cage, and then you found then that was too cheating. limited. Yeah. Essentially, I started cheating, only selecting the bit the chance occurrence that worked, and then I realised that that's, that's just a, yeah. a form of practice. So yeah. Obviously, there are a thousand combinations that won't work, and suddenly something happens. And it's yeah. usually completely in spite of my intention. It's when my def- my intentions have been defeated that I count a work as working. Yeah. If it, if it's a product of intentionality, oddly enough, I feel it, it's not working. And yet, strangely, it's a, it's a weird combination, I suppose. Yeah. But it must be quite hard to know. I mean, it must be quite agonising knowing whether something really is free of your own contrivances or, or part yeah. of them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And it takes me a long time to, to dis- <coughs> dismantle that. I, I, this is a relatively recent mask, and I, I've still only been looking at it for a, a month or two. And I will, I, I'm pretty sure it's a successful one, but I do like to hold on to things for at least six months before. 
oh, they get out into the world. And the dropout rate is vast. This one I was at trying to analyse, because I, I did immediately find this quite humorous. I thought the man reminded me of the politician Roy Hattersley. Yes, and, I, thought um, of a, I thought of a Belgian politician, actually. Yeah, well, somebody who works in the EU. Somebody like yes, that. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, so a slightly bureaucratic That's right, man. Yeah. In and, charge of, of yeah, beef or something. And then you've got this precarious landscape that's almost like something from the sort of roadrunner cartoon. It's like you feel somebody could fall down. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's sort of got a lot of potential for slapstick. Yeah. yeah. It, it, the, 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 the conjoinment. What, what, again, here we have these in, um, amazing sort of coincidental conjoinments, such as the sort of line of the hair. But if in other places, there's a complete disparity between the edge, and you seem to play with that, joining but not joining all the time. Yeah, if they're too good, that's the very first one, actually. This one. This is so this is from what? Mark. And when was this made? 1980, okay. Yeah. And it stood alone for a long, long time. I, I thought, well, I've done that. That's the mask. You thought you'll never find yeah, another I, I one. I didn't think I'd ever do another one. No, I thought that, having done the, executed the idea, I thought, a bit like the blind we looked at earlier, I thought it was a one-off. And, and it was by, I don't know how many years it was, between mask one and mask two. Um, I can't remember, but it was more than five. Do you, I mean, I remember you saying that Picasso is one of your favourite artists and I, it is useful to think of his work in relation to these, I think, just in order to make sense of the incredibly surprising, almost sort of sculptural uh, forms that somehow ma make up the face. And do, you, you, there's almost that, those sort of formal leaps that he makes have somehow been found... Uh, within the completely reproduced image. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you think about... You, 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 you're associated... I mean, you, you were familiar with all the artists who were the members... Well, well, some of the artists who were members of the Metro Pictures group in New York in the 70s, such as Prince, Cindy Sherman, Sherry Levine, and... Um, they are associated with appropriation and sort of just taking, using found images. But your work always seems to, to me to be pointing back towards painting. Oh, well, I'm glad you said that. Do you, do, do, do you feel, feel that? Oh, very strongly, yeah. I, when, I, <laughs> when I first went out, I was invited by Sherry Levine to come yeah. out. She'd seen some of my work in Studio International. So there was a group of them. Yeah, print. so you exhibited with them in the 70s? No, I didn't. No, no. Like, like when okay. I got out there, the Metro Pictures hadn't even opened up at that time. It was still a, yeah. a loft space. Yeah. Uh, they were dealing with their work. But um, I mean, initially, I threw, threw my lot in and I thought, you know, this is where I belonged. And that's really, but I, it, all sorts of things were obviously very different about what I was doing from what they were doing. I had a much stronger connection with surrealism. They had a stronger connection with pop art, I think. Yeah. Their work was big and colourful. Mine was black and white and rather small. Yeah. There were all kinds of distinguishing you, features. Would you say that you're a more romantic artist? Yeah, I think than also I had, a, I had a stronger connection with them. They were very much Duchampians. Um, yeah. And, you know, I was interested in Duchamp, but I didn't feel... I felt... I felt there was something. I didn't like the concept of appropriation either. Um, yeah. I didn't. Appropriation seemed to suggest a kind of mastery of the concept over the image. Yeah. Um, and I felt my mine were findings, um, and these findings were something that opened things up for me, rather than me trying to dominate the image. I was finding myself somehow in the image. So it was a completely reverse thing. It might have been, I don't know, uh, um, subsequent thinking, but um, I, I, I definitely, I mean, at the time, I felt a strong bond. I still do. I mean, Richard and I are very close friends, and he spent a lot of time in London with me. Um, and and the, the, you didn't, there wasn't any sort of moral rejection of the sort of 
uh, create a sort of draftsman, gestural painter type artist no, no, or I, in, no, I, in, in, in your or Richard Prince's work? Or? I think, I don't know, I, don't, I can't speak for Richard. Um, yeah. But I felt more and more uncomfortable with that sort of conceptual edge. Yeah. Doing. I've always felt do you, uncomfortable. Do you still feel that? that? Yeah. 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 I think, I think there's something, well, that's what's wrong with contemporary art, actually, to be honest. Um, is, is art something you have to get lost in? Yes, I'd like, I'd like yeah. to feel yeah. that art appeals to the unconscious. Yeah. And that, but somehow, even in art school, you go to an art school and you and yeah. students are encouraged to put their work up on the wall, yeah. and then they have to defend it. Yeah. I, mean, I hate that. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. the best artists, of course, can't defend it because that's why yeah. art is good. They're regarded as the less successful yeah. ones. Yeah. I, don't know. I, I think conceptualism has got a lot. I mean, it always seems, look, reading about through art history in the 20th century, that the art world is always more rationalised than the art, the best, you know, the, 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 or is that a romantic bit of no, naive I, I, nonsense? I do agree with you, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so in but some. The institutions seem to be acting in the so do you feel, because your work is very much looking for the mysterious within the image, so that is harder. Did you find the reaction to that? It, you know, you, you, the, your work's been around the world in the last decade, but before that, um, you, it was hard to get the, the, the um, recognition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think what happened was I, I felt that... Um, I was better off earning my living from teaching. Yeah. Um, actually, I would have preferred to, it not to have been anything to do with art. Did you enjoy because teaching? I did, enormously. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I chose to teach in a liberal studies department or complementary studies department yeah. so that my own work wasn't in any way highlighted. Yeah. yeah. So I could pursue my own work in my spare time, yeah. essentially. Um, and in that way I felt it was going to be free of any influence. It was a completely defensive thing because yeah. I felt I was too easily influenced you know, by other people and by people's judgments and I wanted to be away from all that yeah. in order to firm up what I had. It seemed such an ephemeral thing that I was trying to do. Yeah, I and you felt I needed you, time. It, if, if you'd been marketed it would have led you off. Yeah. Up, up. Well, I don't know where it would have led me, but I think it yeah, would have yeah. led me away from where I wanted to go. Um, yes. I did feel there was a certain pressure when I was in New York of going in a particular direction. I was encouraged to work bigger and in colour, and I obediently went along with this for a little bit. And yeah. I felt, no, this is all wrong. So. Yeah. Um, it's in, this is um, a collage from the Marriage series, and... Again, I, the Picasso analogy, I think, is relevant because um, somehow the cut between the two faces somehow makes the uh, figure more present, more real, which I, I always see as Picasso is always struggling to make things more real. Yeah. He's not a stylist at all. Would so you say? Yeah, or, no, it's interesting. Uh, Picasso, yeah. I've had a sort of, well, everyone, has, I'm sure, has had a love-hate relationship. Yeah. We all Picasso know. Picasso nearly yeah. stopped me from ever becoming an artist. Like, yeah. He's done everything, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. You know? And we he all produced felt so that. much, yeah. and he was so brilliant. Yeah. So, what we did collectively is we annihilated him from history, and we chose Duchamp to follow. Yeah. He really is a much lesser artist. Um, yeah. But, but, but it, recently it, I've gone back, and it was interesting, it was this series that brought me back to Picasso. I had been looking at his yeah. 1940s portraits, and when I was a teenager, I, my favourite artists were um, Francis Bacon and Picasso. And I realised through Francis Bacon that Picasso uses this technique in his 40s portraits. He'll always combine front view portrait, side view profile, yeah. and three quarter view, always in three. Yeah. And Bacon follows that exactly. Yeah. But he blurs the edges yeah. so you don't quite see the three facets. Yeah. And uh, I, when I started on the marriage series, I couldn't... I started with three, exactly the same way as Picasso and Bacon. Yeah. 
but it, I couldn't, it couldn't make it work. So in the end, they always ended up in two. It's always been a mystery as to why I can't do it. So recently, actually, I've been invited to be in this big show that's coming up in Hamburg. It's been organized by the Picasso Museum of 20th, 21st century homages to Picasso. So there's a lot of contemporary artists all doing work. And they asked me if I would show some of the marriage series. And I said, I'd love to. And I said, I'd love to see this as a point where I can try and work with three facets instead of two. Mm, interesting. It's exactly what I'm working on right now. Oh, and interesting. I'm doing very well. Is it difficult? It must be. Uh, no, I, I've managed one piece, which I think okay. is possible. No. The, 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 the conjoinment here almost seems to be sculptural, it seems to accentuate. What do you I'm think about sculpture? Because the, the cut is so pure and it reminds, me, it, the, it reminds me of a sort of Sarah sculpture in, its, in, in some ways. And I was just, I mean, maybe that's not, but the, I'm, I'm just thinking about whether you think about sculpture, Mark. Do you, do you, who, who do you like? Who, who's your favorite sculpture? sculpture? I can't know. I don't know. I, I, yeah. I feel as I should do the Ad Reinhardt answer. You know, Ad Reinhardt said, sculpture is what you bump okay. into when you back up to look at the But do you, do, you, do you think about the sculpture all yes, in, in your I images, do. Do. the weight of an image? Yes. Or? Weight and whiteness, yeah. This one I thought is interesting. <coughs> I, what I enjoyed about this is, is that sort of a process of, of, of making the, the vertical portrait lie down, the reclining. And yeah, that relationship between horizontality and verticality, which I suppose is a sculptural idea. It, it, I mean, it's also extremely seductive, this image, and the other thing that feels very present about the marriage series of collages is that they are both male and female, and that is more real. In, in, interestingly, it works very well. It makes them more real as well. It makes them feel more vulnerable, doesn't it? I always well, say it, that... The, yeah. the, the combinations of, of, the, of the two figures, the two faces, often feels more like a real person than the original kind of media persona of the, of the original. I mean, in, with this image, the, they're both very beautiful and they've got quite similar faces. Yeah. Whereas, for example, with this yeah. one, they're, they're wildly yeah. different. This is actually based on a Picasso. <coughs> is it? I mean, the, the 1940s. Because the sort of leaps, the disjunctions in this are very yeah. Picassoid. And yeah. I've, I've been through both extremes, and you found the two <coughs> within that series. Is it harder or easier to find the, the more disjointed ones than the ones that go together? It's a balance, really. I think, I think the whole thing is that theme, that, that if they're too close together, they don't work. And if they're too far apart, they don't work. It, it's got to be enough for the, part, for the viewer to be able to participate, to fill it. I mean, we can't reconstruct the faces back together into one place. Here, I often yeah. go to my shows and see people going like this. <laughs> <laughs> and they're obviously desperate to do it. But I, you know, I like the idea that there is a kind of figure it, emerging. It does work, so though. It is very convincing, yeah. but it's just it's hard to see how it works. This one. I like the idea that I'm a, a, a creator of, of people, a Sony. Yeah. It's the closest I get to being rea realist, I think, in these ones. Because I am yeah. to create a convincingly real being. And it, are you way. surprised that you're ending up essentially making portraits or working yeah, within that genre? Long. I don't think anybody can do portraits these days. I'm quite yeah. proud of these, actually. Yeah. Portraiture is something that nobody likes to do. It's but but really it is interesting. Yeah. Just to tell an yeah. interesting anecdote about this piece. I was holidaying with my son on Lake Como. He was about five or six at the time. And I was reading him The Hobbit every night. And uh, we, we come to a description of Prince Elrond. And when I came home, immediately I went, came into the, into the, as soon as I just dropped the barracks, went downstairs. Because I, I had this image, strangely came out of this reading of Tolkien. And I went downstairs and I just produced it straight away. And it was it's kind of, it's wow. weird. I don't know how it happened. It is a strange... So as with the Byron poem, the literary image sort of sets up a field yeah. and things come it together. It belongs to my son, by the way. Ah, it's interesting. Does he like it? He... Yeah. No, he, 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 he's got quite a good collection of my records. 
Yeah. These are both female. That's right, they're called yeah. she's. And the yeah. series called he as well. And that both the faces here are very, very close. They could almost be the same person. So it's interesting that there are no rules to how you put things together. It no. really just happens. Yeah. And then... Do, and how long, how long, I've got a box of bits. Yeah, know. and how long do you wait until... I mean, when you, when you make a collage like that, do you put it in a drawer and then... Yes. Do you wait a few months? Or? Yes, I, I like uh, to wait, wait a while. Sometimes, like that one, I, I mean, there's some you know straight away. You go, wow, great. And they're the best ones. Yeah. Some are more ambiguous. And some I mess around with, you know, for ages and ages. You know, sort of move it a little bit one way, a little bit the other. When somebody recently asked me what my medium, I regarded as my, you know, do I regard collage as my medium? I said, no, blue tack. Because <laughs> it allows you to move it around. I remember you saying once that Pritt stick was yeah, recommended by the Tide for collage. <laughs> by the I've Tide Conservatory. It really destroys. I've stopped with Pritt stick. You don't use Pritt no. stick. What glue do you use? Would be, would well, well, it's fine. It's a secret, I, secret. No, it's not a secret. I don't. You'd you somebody know, I else glue somebody them. Else so, afraid, so, like the Matisse cutouts <laughs> that are glued by somebody else. I'm um, incompetent when it comes to anything. Um, these, for the, um, John has just had a show in New York at the Friedrich Petzl Gallery that was on in October, I think. And um, in this series of work, he's returned to some work he made in the 1980s. So right. you may, and if you go to Tate Britain, there's an example currently up um, in Tate Britain. Yep. It, it, there is in the 1980s oh, room oh, yeah, that's right. that's of the man in profile. Sorry. Um, and they they were made you you made them they, so they're silk screened works on on stretchers they're not on canvas but they're on a particular very dense black fabric yeah. aren't they dyed dyed canvas yeah. um, and you made quite a lot of them and there's an incredible one in Richard Prince's collection if you go on to the Richard Prince website and I really am <laughs> the one of the sort of floating baby. He's got that, it's on his website. Oh. Um, he's got quite a collection. But um, but you made those pieces, and then they were put into storage, and then they were they were rediscovered a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And with this recent show in, in New York, you've returned to that medium, yeah. which is much closer to painting yeah. because it's on the stretcher. Yeah, it, it goes back to what I was describing. When I came back from New, my first visit to New York, I thought, I've got to work in colour. I'm bigger. <coughs> and I felt that imperative. And I, I explored that through silkscreen. And I worked in silkscreen for quite a while. Um, and then I, because of a back problem, actually, I couldn't do it any longer. It never occurred to me to get somebody else to silkscreen. Well, I suppose I couldn't have afforded it at that time. But it was my, my, my wife and I used to silkscreen. You have to have two people to pass the squeegee. And when I did my back in, I, I stopped. And I stopped right at the beginning of a series of pieces using film images. All the other film screens were using different sources. Of images. And I had an illness about a couple of years ago, which I thought, well, I must complete that series. Something got into me. I have to finish that cinematic series. Yeah. And so I thought that I'd just do, I thought I'd just do one or two of these shadow pieces. Like yeah, that. and the, 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 the device of the silhouette was the series you made in the 70s. Yeah, as no, well, 80s, 80s. Where you cut out the oh, film. Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, the you, the, the collages film. go back to the 70s. But the yes, film. you made some collages in yeah. the 70s, but the, the, where the Hollywood star is cut out, and you're just left with that sort of strange non space of, of, of portrait yeah. photographs. And the dark stars um, were shown at the same gallery. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, it, the 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 the, uh, the paintings seem to absolutely create these sort of holes in 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 the gallery. They're, they're quite um, powerful. And I was wondering whether you thought of the. Um, I, I mean, on the one hand, one could see the silhouettes as a sort of empty space, but when when you actually see, and there are there is an example of a couple of. I think three pieces made from this series in, also in the Hayward. 
when you actually see them in the flash, you can't work out whether the uh, negative spaces are solids or voids. They're seen both at the same time. That's exactly what I was trying to do. Thank you. Um, They're not empty vessels for the viewer to sort of fill up. Would you, or would you say that is? I mean, they're they're all men. You, in this you show. can't. You can't actually. They're not. They're, they're oh, okay. okay. Predominantly, yeah. there's a, there's a yeah. reason why they're mostly men. Is women's hair is just so amorphous you don't get that wonderful edge. edge. So you <laughs> need a very pure yeah. edge. Yeah, that's it. It's okay. Well, at least that's my my own thought on it. It may not be. But they, they seem to resist. I mean, one theoretically, one might feel that they're sort of portraits that leave an empty space for the viewer to sort of project onto. But that, I, I don't know whether you feel they work that way. I mean, just looking at the images, I haven't seen the show, but I feel that they resist that, that kind of reading in. Mm-hmm. What, they, they seem... They, they, they seem um, very, they're very mysterious pieces. Yeah. Well, the, as you point out, the original, for the first time I started doing this with, with um, images was on small 10 by 8 collages, which go back to 78, 79, my first ones. And I called them Dark Stars. But I did really feel I wanted them to have that sense of body scale, or actually, these are quite a bit bigger than body scale. That sort of enlarged mm, yeah. scale that you get in cinema. Yeah. That, and this whole show is about cinematic projection. I showed, in fact, one of my films as well. Yeah, we have an image of that. Um, of the, this is an yeah. image of the film. Blind. And the film is made up of literally thousands of film stills. It was shown in the approach, I saw it at the approach. Thousands of film stills going past at, at faster than one a second, I, I think. Uh, well, well, one it, every 24th of a second. But, so one image, uh, so 24 images per second, but they're all different images. That's right. um, the result is really hypnotic. Yeah. When we were talk- I was talking with Oliver about this show, he said, to m- he m- talked about how um, he felt some images were dreamlike and some were like, some images are like hallucinations. Is that a distinction? What, a dream is more based in narrative, whereas a, a, a hallucination is something that has no narrative. It just, do you, is that a distinction? Do you think about... And I, I'm thinking also, because John was also acquainted with Sigmar Polk, and of course he's the... in the 70s, and he's, the, he's, he's really known for wanting to create very hallucinatory... Facts in this painting. Yes. Is this a, something you've thought about, or is this relevant? Um, I think, as opposed to the dream yeah. space, the hallucination yeah. space. I'm interested in cinema as a kind of dream state, um, as a collective dream state. Um, that film, I didn't know how it was going to come out. I called it blind, partly because I had no idea. I knew that we're technically blind to an image projected at 124th of a second. So my idea was that the cinema keeps us in a state of perpetual blindness because we can yeah. never see an image. It's always the next, the next, the next. We're always yeah. following the image, but we never see the image. Yeah. So that's what I mean. We, we have a narrative connection with the image, but we don't ever see it. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'd like to try and explore that not non-seeing. And I had no idea what it would come out like. Yeah, um, and I just I did it. It was another thing. I felt I've got. I must do this. Um, it was quite intense to watch. I mean, I, yeah. I felt it was almost. I, I, I had to turn my eyes away. Yeah, it was you, so start, you, see, you feel your danger, like, don't you? Yeah, first. and then when you You're, yield to it, yeah, you get a very. Int- what I found strange was that you do see the images, but of course you never see the same images at the same time. So the loop can go on forever you'll always see something different. And every person sees a, a, a very interesting a- anecdote. Um, my, my dealer, um, Jake Miller, came to see him when it was first projected at my studio. And he sat down on the bench, just like the one there, and uh, watched it for a while. And he was, <laughs> said, it's an amazing job. He said, but I'm, I'm a bit worried about all the swastikas. 
And, um, <laughs> anyway, I thought, well, I didn't, haven't noticed any source stickers, actually. But, um, so, but my, so my assistant went through all five, 10,000, I can't remember, images, and found five source stickers. We were amazed. Really? Jacob managed to how see how all interesting. Five. So people pick out different yeah, well, symbols from so the plaques. I didn't yeah. want to offend anybody, so we took all the swastika out. Yeah. Um, and then my German agent came over the following week to see it. And she sat on the same page. And after a while, she said, Great job, but um, isn't it extraordinary how the nudity stands out? And yeah, I, how I, I mean, all these were 1940s, 50s images. I knew there was no nudity in it at all. So it could be like used as a sort of site, a raw shash test. It really is. It's quite interesting yeah. what people see. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course it is technically, sorry, no, I want to go on to yours. No, just no, 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 let's stay with it for a bit. But, yeah, right. interestingly, it is, in Bataille's terms, it's a film of pure discontinuity. Because all cinema conjoins us all in the same dream, you might say. Yeah. Whereas this separates us. Every time I see this, it's a completely different film. Yeah. Which I find fascinating. Every time anybody else sees it, it's yeah. Because what happens to be retained retinally and by the brain in a different individual is completely different. So it's, a mis- it's completely the opposite of everything else that I've done in my work. It's com- I've let go here. My wife calls it my abstract expression phase. I, I mean, it is I tempting because I see... Um, abstraction behind so much of your work and this does seem to take it even further in that yeah. direction. It's, I got very excited yeah. with what it opened up but of course that's it really, there's nowhere to go with it. I mean, yeah. I've sort of done it. Yeah. You, were you a fan of The Clock by Christian Mark? Oh, yes. Yeah. I think it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I, yeah. One, of the, yeah. one of the pieces yeah. I'd love to have done. Yeah. 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 He's really, really great. Christian. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. We're now. Let's go on to yours. Ten minutes. Okay. So we're we're just. Thank you for talking about your work, John. Pleasure. Brilliant. Sorry, we've um, taken up all the time on my work. But no, oh, that, that was the, the plan. That was oh, the was plan. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we are going to now just talk about some of the paintings in the show. Um, and these are Mark. This is Mark. Would you like? I don't know. I feel embarrassed. No. Well, can I just say, I love this piece. <laughs> I don't know who it's by. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, you've been here at the cafe, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, I, but one thing I, I wanted to say about this is actually about ten years ago when I was a little, John very kindly suggested I put in a PhD proposal, which I didn't do. But oh, God. It was actually no, I didn't. I I didn't decide not to go in that direction. But it not that it wouldn't. You 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 have you, you're familiar with that that side of, of art education with the PhD. But the um, the 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 proposal that I sort of whipped together was coming really some thoughts coming out of an essay by T. J. Clark on Cezanne, and it but it struck me that Suzanne and um, what the essay, which um, is a Freudian interpretation of Suzanne's bather paintings, (coughs) made me realise was that though Suzanne is always talked about as a great empirical painter, I mean, and he had such incredible range as a painter. He did landscape, still life, and portraiture. But he also had this other line of work, the bathers, which were all completely invented scenes and um, figures um, that he put together and he was really letting off a bit of sort of imaginary sort of psychic steam. Yeah. I found that really fascinating. No, I yeah, no, I love uh, that. Uh, um, and and um, um, the, 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 ba- the subject of the... But the, the other thing... Um, about this painting and this painting, which is they're painted from studies. Um, now I'm talking about myself. I'm I'm talking about about myself. Um, they're, they're, but they're painted from studies that are made um, from um, the studies are made by distorting on a photocopier images of the body that are taken from. But t- kinds of books that you have used at one point, which is sort of 
photo life drawing books that are used by comic book artists and sort of that kind of thing. They're very neutral pictures of the nude, which are distort on the photocopier and paint round, and then that becomes the study that I then use to make the painting. Um, and I, 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 what I'm interested in the way the figures distort the space in the painting, but also the way it puts the figures in their own space, um, as opposed to the collect... With uh, paintings of multiple figures, they... Um, usually they seem to occupy a communal space often rather than uh, the, the separate space as well as the communal space. I, I really Did, love these paintings. I, uh, I, uh, I don't know whether you remember, but you very uh, kindly gave me one of your early studies. Yes, yes, I do. Uh, yeah. Using, uh, yeah, yeah. And actually, uh, but I'm the, really indebted the, to you because the, I bought all those books you've been using. You know, when I came up to your studio, I took down a list of all the names. <laughs> I ordered them myself, but unfortunately, it's, it's a classic thing. It's a contemporary images. I find them really difficult to use. Yeah, I, I sort of like the banal. I, I'm drawn to the sort of banality because they're very just people standing around, but yeah. naked. Um, it's quite hard to find natural um, images of the nude, and I sort of almost have to treat the figure almost like a found object. So I feel it almost difficult to you the idea of taking my own photos, which of course you feel the same way. Yeah. And th this is a painting by Benjamin Senior that's quite interesting. It's almost a sort of distortion of energy through the um, bush in front of the figure that so somehow seems to echo a movement upwards in the body of the figure. I think it looks you, back to front. Yeah. Do you, do, you, do you find it's... I mean, what, what, what did you, um, you, you... You were teaching at St. Martin's during the explosion of figurative painting um, in, with, that, was, that was triggered by the show The New Spirit in Painting. Um, and Gavin Lockhart, one of the artists in the, in the show, and quite a number of people from St. Martin's. Yes, I did notice uh, a few ex-students. Simon Link yeah. as well. And, um, were, were you interested in that resurgence of figurative oh, art yes. in the 80s? <laughs> or Very did you find a lot of people criticised it for being reactionary? No, I didn't think so at all. I think I'm a natural reactionary anyway. So. Yeah. Um, Koffer Donk of Valdez's view... Which reminds me of the Richard Dad fairy fellas masterstroke. Yes, Is that a? No, you, I love that painting. Yeah. That's yeah. no, wonderful. I love that. Are you a fan of Blake? Are you? Do, yes. do you has he been a big mm -hmm. artist? Yeah. yeah. And this is Kovar Donga's other painting, which um, has this sort of slow time. I, 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 I it. it this, this painting for me really slows down time, both in the way it's painted and in the image. Um, I was really surprised by this because I mean I've been following Neil's work for well, a long time, and he what was the last? Me, I suppose, where did I last see a show? Because he, he did a show in about about fifteen years ago. That's very small <coughs> portraits. Yeah, I've seen his work elsewhere, many many places. Out of the muddiness has come this kind of rather startling clarity. I like yeah. it very much. It's interesting how Picasso is coming up a lot. Yeah. Everywhere. Because this is like the sort of Denard period in a way, mm -hmm. or it reminds me of that beach. I mean, it's a sort of strange beach scene, um, but, but sort of generated sort of very automatically yeah. out of hundreds of drawings. Full of phallic images. Yeah, full of. And, a sort of male figure that's been subsumed by a strange sort of elephant-like yeah. persona, um, and then the figure in this. Really um, and, and this is a real discovery to me. I don't know. Um, this is Damien's um, Janus, so it's a double. I know it. And um, I really thought that was extraordinary. So Damien, Damien. Um, makes these, these busts out of clay and then lights them and photographs them and paints them and 
it's quite interesting, Damien was saying that if you, had, if you saw the bust in reality, it's really nothing. Mm. So the painting makes it, gives it the... Yeah. Um, quite a discovery. And Darren Marshall's Snow, which mm. is the most minimal piece, and Freya's um, painting, which is reminiscent of the um, shadows in the Hitchcock film. But this, um, this image is actually, um, she told me, is taken from Walkabout, Nicholas Rowe. Oh, really? Um, there was a quite... A very early film by Nicholas Rowe. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. I don't remember. So the, the shadow there is, I've forgotten the name, the child actress. Um, Jenny Agatha. Jenny Agatha, okay. And Gavin Lockhart's painting, which can, it's very Hitchcockian, sort of very buried image of a steam yeah, train. really beautiful. But it also reminds me of Richard Archfarger's yes. exclamation yeah. marks. It's got this strange sort no, of graphic, yeah. almost... Are you an Ed Ruscha fan? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And yeah. But this, like, this is really yeah. beautiful. Yeah. I love the way it eclipses, you know, that sense of eclipse. It's kind of either or of perception. You can either see the background or you see the background. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very strange. The it's fact, a vantage point, too. It reminds me of that painting by William Coldstream at Euston Station. I don't know whether you're aware of that. Yeah. And Geraldine Swain's painting of a possible victim of a serial killer. Yeah, there's... Painted from a photograph taken by the serial killer in a motel room somewhere in the Midwest. Quite powerful. Yeah, scary stuff. Scary. And scary because of its small size. Yes. And, and another portrait. Um, Did these white people do it? Well, we don't know what happened to them, but they sort of exist... They're, they're very poignant because they exist in a sort of nowhere, in a limbo, in a yeah. way. Um, and Kate Lydon's um, painting... Um, Terrifying in a different way. <laughs> um, oh, something's gone wrong. And Simon's painting... Which completely took me by surprise. Sorry, this is, this is Nathan's painting, but we can... Only, and Sim, Simon Link, who um, paints has made these paintings from Victorian photographs, but this is a staged photo, Victorian photograph. So, in a way, very inauthentic, a bit like the film stills. Um, I'm still interested in this question of why the inauthentic mm -hmm. and the fake should be so evocative when it comes to being used. But, um, and, and this portrait of Jane Morris, William Morris's wife, who was sort of pursued relentlessly by Dante Gabriel Rossetti um, and of Stephen Chambers. Um, yeah. you, you've also used this cut yes, into I the have. face, haven't you? Yeah. Like a sort of psychic space yeah. that's opening out. That's a really interesting painting. I haven't seen Steve's work for a while. Um, so that's a view of the show. So um, thank you, John, for the conversation. So... I think now there's an opportunity, if anybody would like... Two minutes. We've got, we've got about... So if anybody would like to ask a question... Does, would anyone... Um, you, uh, when you're talking about the sequence and the narrative, uh, you talked about the sequence and the narrative, and you talked about the I think he also said something along the lines that um, cinema moves through you and you, you move around a painting. It's the, mm. you're, you're rendered impassive and static by cinema because it just flows across you. Whereas the painting, mm. you, you can walk, you walk around, you're, you, you're, you're in charge of the image, you, you have a mastery, you're allowed a mastery, you're deprived of that mastery by cinema. That's his argument. 
Sorry? The masses seek distraction. You know, they look on their work, their woes, they go to the cinema, so they, um, they're distracted by their taking out of themselves, whereas art actually has to require concentration in a way that... That's, that's, that's what Bencher would say. Yeah. yeah. I would say it's slightly different. But yeah, he was a big influence. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So, any other questions? I've made four, and I'll tell you what put me off. I went to the Sydney Biennale, and walking around the Sydney Biennale from one darkened room to the next, I think we've, we've reached the point now where the white cube is no longer the big problem, it's the black cube. Um, <laughs> and I just thought, I, I, I swore as I came out of the Sydney Biennale, I would never make another film of that kind that you have to go into a darkened space for. But I am actually quite interested in making... I am working on a film to be shown in the cinema, but I'm, I won't say more about it. I've been convalescing from an illness. I was told not to work, so I spent a lot of time watching TV, and uh, I found myself watching old movies um, on t TCM, and I kept taking note of the film, <coughs> which I found in certain fragments. So I'm working on a sort of collage film from old 40s, 50s movies to be projected in some. But I've got one problem that's holding me back. I've collected all the material, but it's sound. And it, the idea of it being silent is just anathema to cinematic consumption. But I'm trying to create a, a narrative moving film in which you're not deprived of the ability to see it's a bit big challenge, but I'm hoping to make it. Do you think it might have a soundtrack? Or? I've got to. I've been reading a lot about sound. Um, yeah. And the more I read... But not more, music, something else. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I'm as early, at early stages. <coughs> well, I'd like to... Oh, oh question. 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 Yeah, there was, a, there was an old lady that picked up, like, driftwood off the beach and stuff, and she made, like, Kirsch Fitters like um, contraptions and things. But then she ran out of then she ran out of um, all the driftwood and coloured wood because there wasn't any left because it's gone into the seventies or the eighties and there weren't any old wooden boats anymore. So she ended up picking up um, bottle tops and plastic bottles and things. And yeah. So she made sculpture out of that. So if so if we did run out of all these black and white pictures that you go into you know, Harry Potter's you know, that green road off uh, Charing Cross Road, it's funny little. Sound of this old town and stuff. Yeah. Would, you, would you go the sort of like the Keith Tyson route, just, just looking on the internet, Google, Google images, and go, uh, let's look for a cowboy, uh, let's look for um, the Grand Canyon, and stick that together? Yeah. Would that be really, really, you know. I can't, I can't imagine working like that, but you've put your finger totally on a fundamental anxiety in my mind. <laughs> um, and the only way that I've compensated for is um, I've started to buy in, in huge bulk. So these days, instead of going around to a shop and buying half a dozen film stills, I now buy entire archives. But, come, but because I now see it, this has also created another problem. Because now I see that this material is running out, I realise that actually this is a, a photographic genre that's disappearing. So part of my work now is preserving so I have this sort of double life now. I have. I'm both trying to create an archive of film stills and portraits from the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and onwards. Now, now that film stills are, is a kind of, well, no, it's an extinct genre. It's, uh, I'm, I'm conserving it, but on, and on the other hand, I'm the sort of vandal in the archive. It's a sort of paradoxical position. And I don't know how I'm going to resolve this at all. It's so a kind of big moral issue for me. So it's again like the fruit stick thing. You don't want it, you might well re photograph it and then stick I it to I know, everyone says stick. I should do that. Yeah. I don't know. This. The moment I do that, I feel as though there's something being lost. There I has to be a sacrifice somehow. I have those um, the A4 pockets 
So if I cut something out and I place it in the pocket so it's there, but if someone else shook it around, it will all fall apart. But the thing is, I always worry about placing the thing so it's going to tease little pin pinholes and things. Yeah, yeah. My only consolation is that I'm probably not going to be around forever, so I can't do too much more damage. I mean, in view of the fact that I recently bought an archive of 250,000, now I, I, it would probably take me 10 years to even make my way through that archive. So a large portion of that, I imagine, will survive. Though I am, I am, I mean, there was an article in the British Journal of Photography which which really put its finger on my practice. It said, John Stesica, thief and vandal. Mm -hmm. And there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to thank John Stesica, thief and vandal, for the talk, <laughs> and for shedding light on... I think, it, it, I think you'll agree it was the perfect complement to the show, and thank you, John, for demonstrating how through painting we can destroy narrative. Thank you very Thank you much. Very much.